So that was back in 2018. <laughs> obviously, I've gotten a lot older, but my wife has obviously gotten way more prettier. But um, hey, we played that because I just want to challenge you guys. Small group season is coming. And um, if you ask me where I would be today based off where I was four years ago, nowhere, nowhere near. In fact, like 2018, Pastor Adam said, hey, join my small group. Let's learn about discipleship. What's this discipleship thing you talk about? And there, that's where it started, y'all. I stepped out. I did something different. And God called me to a life of discipleship, which he's calling everybody to a life of discipleship. And then four years later, I'm standing on the stage preaching to you. Bizarre. So you, you don't, that, that's a testament of what God will do if you step out. So I'm challenging you. If you're considering co-leading, try. If you're feeling tired as a leader, find a co-leader that you can pull up with you. If you're considering for the first time joining a small group, I say do it. Because you're not going to learn everything from me. You're not going to learn anything from fast, everything from Pastor Adam. Or you, you got to need this community right here. So that's why I showed that. And it was actually a good reminder for myself of how good God is, especially when he surrounds you with the right community. So I'm super, super excited today because we're, we're continuing our Cultivate series. And, and Pastor Adam brought a great word on hunger desire. Who enjoyed that one last week? Yeah, that was good. That's good. And, and if you weren't here with us, man, I would challenge you. Go back to our Facebook and our YouTube page. You're going to need to understand what's going on here at Journey. Because we're saying that the hunger and desire for God is the, ground, is the foundation for personal revival in our lives. And that's what we truly want, right? Is that what you want? You want personal revival? You want transformation in your life, right? I don't believe we just come to church just to go through the motions because... That would be a waste of time. Man, so this week I saw people fasting for the first time. Good. Praying more. Reading their Bibles more. Getting back to good rhythms. Getting healthier. So I just want to encourage you all, keep on doing that. Why? Well, not only is it right, but you're building patterns. You're becoming better than yesterday, as I would love to say. That's one of my friends, they know that. Oh, man, Adrian's going to say better than yesterday. But that's what I truly believe. That's the call for the church, that you should never be in one position, always moving forward. So that's why we're going to talk about spiritual habits today. Spiritual habits. See, I could sit up here all day and talk about how my rhythms work for me, but let's take a walk through Scripture and see the pattern of Jesus, right? See, your spiritual habits determine the trajectory of your life. And that's why it's super, super important. So today we're only going to spend about five hours on this topic, on one topic. Um, so I'm glad that all of you are here and all of you watching online, just keep it on going, okay? But in all seriousness, I would love to cover it all, but I believe that God has given us a timely word for this moment right now. So we'll cover a few. I'll introduce it, give you some practical things, and uh, we're just expecting God to move in our lives. You guys good? Ready? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come. Father, none of these people came to hear me speak. They came to have an encounter with you. I came to have an encounter with you. So Lord, in this moment, would you use your word to release people? Release bondage, break down walls, give them new habits new rhythms, give them insight into what you are doing, Father. God, this has nothing to do with us and everything to do with you. So, Lord, would you increase as I decrease? And, God, would you just allow people to see clearly and to understand, open their minds, open their hearts, Father, to receive the word from you today, Father. We praise you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Thanks, Ellis. So, spiritual habits. Who's excited about habits? Because I'm going to talk about all of your habits, good and bad. Oh. So you might have heard spiritual habits be called spiritual disciplines before. Who's heard spiritual disciplines? Well, for the sake of today, I'm calling it spiritual habits. Because everyone has habits, not everybody has discipline. 
All right? So, when I, let me, let me prove to you a point here. When I use the word discipline, participate with me. How many of you instantly get tired? You start feeling like, oh, man, he's going to tell us one more thing to do. I feel a little defeated. Adrian's going to tell me to get up at 3.30 in the morning and pray and work out. No, I'm, I promise. I promise I'm not going to tell you that. But it does say in Mark 1, verse 35, that very early in the morning, while it was dark, Jesus got up. He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. So I'm not going to tell you that. But the life of Jesus patterns different things for us to, to follow, right? So let's define this. What is a spiritual habit? Spiritual habits are practices that you can find patterned by Jesus and his followers in Scripture that promote spiritual growth among believers. It deepens our relationship with God. These are habits of devotion, habits of experiential Christianity. What is that? That means you get to know God, you get to find God through experiencing him through circumstance. So I said this back in December, if you ever needed a faithful God, he emplaces a circumstance in your life where you cry out to him and he proves himself to be faithful. So now you know his attribute of faithfulness. If you've ever needed a God of provision, Jehovah Jireh, and you call out to him and he provides provision, so now you know his attribute of provision, experiential Christianity. You get to know Christ through experience him through circumstance. So all these practices by design were given by Jesus to transform our lives. Like training exercises for spiritual life, uh, well, these are the training exercises for your spiritual life. For instance, if you have a gym membership and you never go, can you expect change? Yeah, everyone's laughing because they already know the answer to that. Same thing in your spiritual life. If you don't apply these spiritual habits, well, you can't feel the impact. You can't feel the difference in your life. So these things have to be practiced every single day. Why? Because your spiritual life is way more important than your physical life. So if, if you have to exercise regularly, eat healthy regularly to survive, you need to work on your spiritual life even more so. Right? Who agrees with that? So spiritual habits, they're not, they're not characters, they're not qualities, they're not attitudes, they're not fruits of the spirits. They're things you actually have to do. You have to do it. Like, for instance, joy is not a spiritual habit. It's not. It's a fruit. It's a byproduct. It's a result of your good habits done right. Right? So spiritual habits would be things like Bible reading, meditating. I think I saw it on there. There it is. Praying, fasting, worshiping, celebrating, serving, learning, resting, silence, silence, solitude, glorifying God through your body. Man, these are just a few. There are so much that we can do to increase, uh, to, to cultivate the soil of our spiritual lives for personal revival. So we're priming, we're working. These are things that you have to do in order to experience that. See, spiritual habits done with the right motivation, the motivation to draw closer to God, to bring him glory, man, they lead to a life of transformation, plain and simple. Plain and simple. See, we all have habits. Our life is full of them. You know, we're a goal-setting, dreaming, a journaling uh, generation, and that's great. I, I, I tell people all the time, you should be doing those kind of things. But guess what? Your life, it's not a product of your dreams. It's not a product of your visions, of your goals. It's a product of your habits, what you actually do. So therefore, we make our habits and our habits make us. We make our habits. What we do matters. And guess what? It produces itself in our life. So our habits make us. So whatever you are, whatever I am, it's not a mystery to anybody. It's a collection of the good and the bad things that you do in your life. Right? The patterns, the rhythms in your life. And so if we want to be a truly transformed person, if we want to be the man or woman of God that we really aspire to be, I mean, we're really going to have to get serious about onboarding the habits that Jesus patterned in Scripture. Like, it's non-negotiable. These are non-negotiables. Do we understand that? Do we understand what a non-negotiable is? It means if you want to succeed, you got to do this. You with me? Or you're like, oh, man, where's he going with this? 
I'll tell you. I'll tell you where we're going. See, I believe that this is the intent of the Father. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. And, and this is a guiding verse for myself and the ministry outside of the church that I have. But it goes like, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, the Holy Spirit gets in your life, right? He starts this process, a process that doesn't end this side of heaven. And he wants to complete you. He wants to make you blameless, faultless. He wants to perfect you the best that you can here on earth in your spirit, in your mind, and in your body. See, I believe that sometimes we get to be people or we are people like, God, I really want to be who you want me to be. But I don't want to change my rhythms in life because it's going to inconvenience me. Man, if you do what you've always done, you can always expect the same result. Hands down. That's facts. You do what you've always done, you will expect the same results. So if we're people saying we want spiritual revival and I want to do the same thing and not read my Bible, well, then you can expect the same results. So here's the interesting thing about habits. I did a little bit of research on habits. So this isn't Adrianism. This, isn't, this doesn't come from my life. It's science, okay? Science says that you just can't drop a bad habit. I'm sorry. You new year, new me people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, what they say, how do you get rid of a bad habit? You displace a bad habit with a, an even greater habit that has a ton of influence. That's greater. You got to disperse it. Here's an example, right? December 31st, uh, you went from eating uh, terrible in the vending machine. And then you said, January 1st, I'm going to work with uh, my baggie of salad and carrots. So January 1st comes around, 8 o'clock, and you're like, man, that Snicker bar is great. But this carrot is better. Right? I've seen it. I may have done it. Uh, Adrian, uh, we're going to lunch. We're going to Chick-fil-A. This salad is much better than Chick-fil-A. Y'all, who am I fooling? That, that type of influence of a carrot and a salad in my personal life is not strong enough to displace bad habits. I'll take it one step further for your spiritual life. My wife and I, um, so we own a gym, and sometimes we often just close the doors down, and it's just us, and we blast worship music. And we end up just praying and sometimes crying and doing less working out. But that is a rhythm that we have. And guess what? We get to experience God's presence in that moment. And it's so good. Guess what? I want it more. I want it more. I want it more. That in and of itself, God's presence is in and of itself, is strong enough to displace any bad habits. Try it. Try it. So if you want to experience personal revival, holy encounters, a life of abundance, purpose, renewing of your mind, your body, your soul to be complete in every way, well, then you're going to have to really get serious about your habits. So I got a ton of notes, a ton of scripture. Um, I believe you can actually text this number on the screen and follow along with some of these notes. So if you get lost, you, my notes are on there for you to uh, go back and meditate on. And hopefully it, it helps your spiritual life, especially this week. So I'm going to talk fast. So listen fast, okay? So point number one, spirit care. Spirit care, a habit of consistently abiding. Adrian, you're always, every time you preach, you're talking about abiding. I will always talk about abiding. And you'll see why in a second. Your spirit is so important. So let's go to 2 Timothy 3, verse 14 through 17. It's on the screen for you. But as for you, continue in. Say, continue in. Oh, man, come on. Continue in. Continue. What you have learned and have become convinced of. Because you know those from who you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures, say all. All, all scriptures God breathed. And is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's given you everything. He's equipped you for every good work. So Paul in this letter to Timothy is making it super personal. He's saying, hey, Timothy, dude, you got to continue in doing the right things that you have been taught. 
And some of y'all need to underline that, write it in your journal, um, a screenshot or whatever. You need to continue in doing the things that you've always known you're supposed to do, especially if you've been in church for quite a while. Why? Because I, I love this. Watch this. In this context, continue, that word continue is translated to the Hebrew word menos, which means abide. Abide. No, I, I, I freaked out when I saw that. I was like, that is so good, God. Of course you would make it abide. He's saying, stay connected to me. Remain. Tarry a while. Do the things that you need to be doing. Continue remaining faithful. Stay connected to me. Do the right things. So continue in what you're doing. See, John 14, 4 through 7 says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. You can't do anything in life with lasting legacy that's going to make an impact for the Lord that, if you're not abiding, if you're not connected to the source. It's, it's facts. So take that one step further. When you stop connecting, when you stop abiding, when you stop doing the things that you know you're supposed to be doing, like going to church, tithing, ooh, reading your Bible, praying, meditating, fasting, getting in small groups and community, leading your families, exercising, when all of these things, when you stop doing all of that, well, life just tends to fall apart, doesn't it? You start to feel the pressures of life a little bit more, right? Well, I know I do. So it's, a, it's an awareness. It's something that God brings to your mind and say, hey, check your rhythm. Check the things that you're supposed to be doing. You need to continue in doing that. So, for some of you, that might, that might feel a little rough. You're like, hey, Adrian, I, I've fallen off many bandwagons. It's invisible anyways. It's okay. Get back on it. Start again. I didn't hit my seven-day streak in my Bible. It's okay. Start again. You don't stop. Man, I, I ate while I was fasting. It, it's okay. God knows your heart. That's all he wants anyways. Continue in. I sinned yesterday. I pro we're probably going to sin today. All right? Continue in. It's okay. Because this is a continual process on this side of heaven that will not stop. But let's, let's be honest for a second. Humor me. When you start a new habit in your life, when it's good, right, you immediately start feeling the pressure. Right? Who feels that? Like things just start happening. And guess what we do? Especially when you're digging deep in your spiritual life, right? You're like, God, I want everything. So you start, you've got all these books, you've got all these apps, you've got everything. You're at every church service, and that's great. And you start feeling the pressures of life. It starts hitting you. And what do we do? We're like, oh, the devil has this target on my back. Don't give him that much credit. Don't give him that much credit. And I'll say that. You know why, y'all? Because guess what? The devil is not omniscient. He doesn't know your mind like God does. He's not omnipotent. He's, he's not all-powerful like God is. Right? He's not omnipresent. It means he can't be with you everywhere. So don't give him enough credit. Sure, I understand that things happen and, 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 and uh, he does kind of annoy us. But guess what? This is, this is from my personal observation, all right? You can take it or leave it. But when we actually start aligning ourselves with God, the resistance and the opposition that we feel actually, he starts revealing everything in our life and our patterns and habits that isn't really aligned with him. That means your time, your money, the people you hang out with, your hobbies. You couldn't fit that hobby in before when you were trying to do things with God. Well, maybe it's because it's not in alignment with him. You can't, I can't tithe, I can't do all of these things because where is your money going? It reveals things that aren't aligned. Does it make sense? So don't give the devil that much credit. Continuing in this process knowing that, guess what, the resistance is a good thing. You know, Pastor and Adam, we actually joke a lot about this. Like, we'll ask each other how things are and, um, you know, when we feel a little bit of resistance, we're like, yeah, that was rough. But guess what? 
That's good because we know we're on the right path. So what do we do? We just keep on. Keep in. Keep doing that. You're going to feel resistance. But is the cost worth? Is the cost worth the payout? Are you willing to pay it? Man, I'm going way off my notes. Thank you, Jesus. So day by day, moment by moment, continue in your pursuit of God. And here's a practical way to do that. Read your Bible. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm not going to give you anything super special today. I'm just going to state the obvious because I think the Holy Spirit will do that in your lives. He will, he will give you something different. So read your Bible. There's no retirement in pursuing God. There's none. So read your Bible. Get in his presence. Meditate. See, Paul says in verse 15, Timothy, you've known the scripture since you were a baby. Many of you in this room have known scripture if you've been attending church for quite a while, or you grew up and someone was reading you the Bible, or praying over you, or if you have the Bible app. How many have a Bible app here? You know. Ooh. But he says, keep reading God's word every day. Why? Practically speaking, the payoff is wisdom. It'll make you wise. That's what he says in verse 15. It'll make you wise. Check this uh, uh, quote out by an author, John Blanchard. He says, how often should we read the Bible? Surely we have only to be realistic and honest with ourselves to know how regularly we need to turn to the Bible. How often do we face problems, temptations, and pressures? Say it with me. Every day. Every day. Then how often do we need instruction, guidance, and greater encouragement? Say it with me. Every day. To catch all of these felt needs up into an even greater issue, how often do we need to see God's face, hear his voice, feel his touch, know his power? Man, the answer to all of these questions is the same. It's what? Every single day. But hear me out for a second. The latter part of verse 15 says it will make you wise for salvation. So not only will it make you wise and give you discernment to understand his will and to know what to do, but it will make you wise for salvation. Adrian, what are you talking about? Well, participate with me for a second. James 1.22 says, don't be hearers of words, but... What? Don't be hearers or receivers of words, but... So you know scripture. So how about this? We were meant to be reproducers of the word of God. See, you're setting your sights way too short if you think that what you do is just gain knowledge here from the pulpit or from your own personal um, quiet times. If you just keep it for yourself. It it was never meant to be that way, y'all. See, the church was never meant to be a place where you just come and receive and and then you get your filling on that one day and you're good to go and, and never put action to it. The time you spent meditating, fasting, praying, seeking God was never meant for you just to be uh, to selfishly hold to yourself. Sure, it edifies the body, but guess what we're supposed to do with that? We're supposed to share that with the world. It makes you wise for salvation. So here, check this out. The church was meant to be a hospital for those who are broken, who are hurting, who are experiencing emotional damage, mental and spiritual damage. People who are in need of a savior. Who in here professes that Jesus Christ is Lord? I want to see your hands. Look around the room. And that is a testament of Jesus Christ. But guess what? I'm going to tell you. This church is a training ground to activate your faith. It is a training ground. So you actually get to take Matthew 28, go into the world and make disciples, but you get to train here. How? Well, in community. But how can you teach someone something you don't know? So if you're not constantly abiding, if you're not constantly connecting or reading the word of God, how can you and I go iron sharpens iron and you can't show me a way or I can't show you a way? Right? Does that make sense? So what happens is you take what you have on a personal encounter and, man, you spread that here. You join a small group, you get in a relationship, and it starts to grow. It starts to grow. And then you have people who go outside of the walls, and they start to do exactly what's repeatable here. Because discipleship is a repeatable process. But it starts with the source, abiding in the source. But guess what? You got to be consistent. 
Consistency is a fleeting thing in this society, is it not? You got to be consistent if you want to be, uh, if you want to go to where God has called you. So see, some of you in this room are a product of consistency. consistency. That means someone consistently was praying for you. Yeah. That's you. And that's good. Someone was consistently inviting you to church. Someone was consistently in the prayers, warring for you, speaking to you, loving you. That's why consistency is so important in this process. Because without it, someone might not come to know Jesus, y'all. That may have been you. And thank God for the people who consistently pressed in for others. And so some of you, like I said, are products of the consistency. So practically speaking, what does this look like? What does abiding look like? Men, parents, women, abiding is connecting with God daily. You get into a rhythm of not only reading your Bible, praying and seeking after God through worship and meditation, but you also get to teach. How many of you all have children in here? That's our next generation. How many, there's leaders of this household who are leading ministries. You need to be teaching other leaders. You need to be inspiring other leaders. What what we are learning in our own personal walk with him, what we are learning on a Sunday is not to be hoarded, it's to be shared, it's to be shown to people so that they can cultivate this life of intimacy with God. And I'm just going to give a little testimony here. I got a picture of what that looks like in my own life. That, that is my boy. And um, he, did, he doesn't know that I took these things, and I don't even see him here, so that's good. Um, but that place right there, I spend hours there in the morning in the dark with a candle that you could see. And I came home one day, and his stuff was over my stuff, and I was just like, man, they are watching what you are doing you are teaching them what, the, what intimacy with Christ. But guess what? That boy, will, one day, he will take my shoes, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And so that's God. That's God because my prayer in my life has been, nine, uh, Psalms 90 verse 16 says, let us, your servants, see your work again. Let our children see our glory. And so parents, youth leaders, When you get in relationship with these children and you show them how God is speaking, how he's moving, when you involve them in your life, when you show them these prayer requests and you get to pray together, what does it say? Your children will see his glory and Julian is experiencing God's glory. And that to me, that's worth it all. That's worth the cost. That's worth those 3 a.m. wake-ups. See, if you've always done, if you always do what you've always done, then you can always expect the same results. So parents, change your rhythms. Change your rhythms. Leaders, change your rhythms. See, John Maxwell said this about consistency. He says, motivation gets you going. We love that. But discipline keeps you growing. That's the law of consistency. So it doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter how many opportunities you receive. If you want to grow, consistency is key. So spiritually speaking, if you want to grow, continue in. Stay consistent. Get serious about your daily rhythms because they're going to sharpen and strengthen your spirit. And i got to get moving, man. I can be here all day. Point two, temple care. Take care of your temple. You only get one. Take care of your temple with a habit of rest and health. You only get one body. You only get one body. And guess what? In other words, I'm saying take care of yourself, self-care. You have to. You have to. You have to embrace the fact that we are humans. Embrace your humanity. You get tired. You get stressed. You get sick. You go to the hospital. You have ailments. These are natural things. And guess what? They're they're deterrences from us continuing in and, and serving the Lord. Right? So don't tune me out here because I believe this is a serious issue in our generation. See, if the devil can't slow you down, he'll speed you up. We read this book once. If the devil can't slow you down, he'll speed you up. What does that look like? In 24 hours, he's going to give you 30 hours of work. 
And 90% of that are not right now crisis, but we're going to do it anyways. So take a Sabbath rest. Take a Sabbath rest. Pastor Adam's always on me to take a Sabbath rest because my mind is like, but that's good. That's called accountability. And if you don't have someone to be accountable to, small group season is coming. Y'all catch the drift where I'm going here today? Small groups, okay. See, I think that when we think about um, fasting and praying and, and going to church and stuff from the Bible times, we're like, man, all they did, uh, they were just sitting on the ground. They just lived in huts. It was easy for them. I mean, at least I did. But no, but let me give you an accurate description of the culture back in the Old Testament. Amos 8.4. This was their attitude. It says, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat? They were already thinking about how they're going to make money the next day right after the Sabbath. So they weren't even resting. They were thinking right through it. The, actually, the chapter is, man, they were living a life of deceit. They were cheating people. Doesn't it sound like our generation right now? But see, that's why Sabbath, it clashes with our culture. Our culture's emphasis on consumption, efficiency, productivity, time management. See, when we become super efficient at something, we can do more. See, that's why God was inviting us to live a life of joy, free from burdens and heaviness. And he wanted us to pattern our life after his lifestyle. That's why Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 uh, through 30 says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Come to me, get away with me, abide in me, and you will recover your life. Who needs to recover their life? I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Walk with me. That's a continuous action. You walk with them and work with me. Labor with them. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. He's inviting us into his rest and so often we just zip right past through that. And see, we're a generation, uh, you know, we want to have a Mary's heart, but we're living in a Martha world. So instead of sitting at Jesus' feet, we're being a Martha. We'd rather serve. That's why the Sabbath was a command because it's not natural for us to rest. So if the devil can't slow you down, he'll speed you up. So practically, what does that look like? What does taking a Sabbath in your life look like? It means retreat, get away from the world. Set apart silence, times of silence and reflection. Why? Because it can permanently change your understanding of God and how he's moving. You got to rest. Some of y'all need sleep. You got to rest. It's good for your mind and your body. Hey, on the Sabbath, when you're resting, learn to say no. Learn to say no. In a generation that says yes, that means, hey, I'm not offending you, but guess what? This is not a right now crisis. This is not a right now crisis. Why? Because when you're having that Sabbath rest, you get to do what? You get to revise and examine your priorities. Check your alignment with God. God, am I, am I on point today? No. This week, what do we need to adjust? You can't do that if you're always saying yes. Pause. Pause often. Pause throughout the week. Take moments throughout your week where you're like, you'll, you will accept interruptions, opportunities for spiritual growth. God wants to get alone with you. Hey, this is a good one. Find enjoyment. Find enjoyment and refreshment through interacting with people or in God's creation or in things of enjoyment. Because, you know, part of our tiredness and our mental and emotional damage comes from not only from the weight of our work, but from the joylessness of never partaking in things of enjoyment. And he's inviting us into a life of enjoyment and rest. So in order to take care of your temple, you got to Sabbath. In order to take care of your spirit, you got to abide and connect with him. But what about the body? You knew I was going there, y'all. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You don't belong to yourself. Exercise and healthy patterns, they serve the soul well. Why? Because in the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, he says that God wants to perfect you. His spirit wants to be in you. He wants to give you a perfect mind, body, and soul. So... I can't negate the fact that I need to take care of my body. 
See, God wants to perfect and strengthen your spirit through abiding, through staying connected to him. He wants to give you a sound mind through experiencing peace and rest by consistently taking Sabbath rest, pausing. He wants your temple to be faultless, to be whole, to be readily capable for any task that he asks of you. And that's your responsibility. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 9 says, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train. Say train. Train. Train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. So Paul's saying, Timothy, train, exercise, yes, in godliness, which means to be like God, but he doesn't discredit the fact that he said physical training is good. In the natural, it brings benefits. God, let, let me give you an example. God, you, you, have you known somebody? I have known people who, man, they were on fire. They can make impact in this life. They, they, they have the ability to, to shift everything in the room because they are that close to God, but they do not have the health to back it up. They do not have the health to back it up. And while that triggers some people, it's a challenge to you to be healthy because if you desire to serve the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind and forever until you meet him in eternity, you got to be healthy. If I want to continue preaching for the rest of my life and sharing in this life with you, i got to be healthy. I can't have people picking me up. I can't have people saying, can you preach this sermon for me because I just don't, you know, my, my habits left me where I'm at. Get serious. Get serious about yourself. And that is your responsibility. I say this all the time. Your responsibility means your ability to respond to life. And what does verse 9 say? Paul says, this is a trustworthy saying. You should accept it. Take it to the bank. It is what it is. This is a good thing to say. So see, our bodies are to be used to serve him, to honor him, to ultimately bring him the, the glory he deserves. 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 says, You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. He didn't say, escape your body to glorify him. He said, no, in your body glorify God. So your body is meant for glorifying God. One of my closest friends, um, Joel Martin, some of you might know him, he's not in here, but he walks with one leg, and that doesn't, oh, there he is. He's such an encouraging testament to me and, and an accurate description of what I'm just talking about. His body is broken, but he is walking. He is living out patterns in his life. And guess what? The unsafe people in his life get to see that. He rubs off on that, and he is glorifying God through his body in his, his certain position. And that's good. And God said, continue in. Continue doing that. And y'all, if you've fallen off that invisible wagon, whatever it is, whether it's Sabbath or, or, or health, start again. So as a Christian, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This is all for his glory. Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So as a Christian, you bear his name. How do you display how do you accurately display him? And so we're wrapping up here. I want to encourage you guys because I know that's a lot, and, and some of you, I got to work on one thing at a time, but um, 2 Peter 1.3, I just want to encourage you. 2 Peter 1.3 says, For his divine power has bestowed on us, Absolutely everything necessary for our dynamic spiritual life and godliness through true and personal knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So God is saying, I've given you everything. I've given you everything that you need to live a dynamic, full life. Everything. That means all the spiritual patterns of my life, I've given you these patterns so that you can exercise them and so you can see the results and the impact. But if you don't, that falls on you, not me, because I have given you everything. I've given you everything. He's given us the patterns through scripture. He's given you an invitation to rest. He's given you a temple to glorify him. 
And if we're people who are saying, God, we want personal revival, we want to cultivate this soil in our lives, we've got to get serious about these three things. And there's many more, but these were the ones that God had said, hey, this is for the church today. Take care of your spirit. Abide in me. Take care of your temple. Rest. Make sure that you are physically sharp so when I call you, you can do these things. Would you stand to your feet with me? And ministry team, you guys can join me at the front. So ask yourself in this moment, be serious with yourself. Are you living a life that reflects the living God in you and through you and through your spiritual habits? If you answered no to one of those, I'm going to invite you forward to lay it down and, and consecrate, to separate yourself, to give yourself devotedly to getting back and, and, and starting again. For those of you who feel that, if you've fallen off the bandwagon, I invite you, find rest. Let's do this again. Some of you in the room, you've never experienced the peace that God gives you through salvation. And you came here because the church is a hospital for the broken. I'm inviting you. Come find rest. Come find rest. And as we sing this song, I'm giving this, all of you, an opportunity to get serious with God. Get alone with him. Say, God, these are the things I'm committing to this week. These are the spiritual habits that I need to reinvent or retry. And he will show you. If you do what you've always done, you can expect the same result. So I'm challenging you in this moment, as we sing this song, that you do something different and watch God do something different in your life. Come on, let's go.